Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. We want to welcome you to our uh, Wednesday night Bible study here at San Juan Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, we're going to go ahead, uh, jump in and get started and ask uh, Reverend Legister to open us in a word of prayer, please. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for another day. Uh, and as we draw to the close of this day, for the privilege that is ours to meet and to seek to delve into your word, not just to be informed, but indeed to understand more clearly your will for our lives as we seek to serve you and to glorify your name. We thank you for our brother, Reverend Chisholm, and for the wealth, wealth of knowledge that he brings to the, his understanding and interpretation of the word. And we ask that you, you would help us to have a, a open mind, ready to grasp what is dished out to us that will be beneficial to us in order to keep us going forward and able to carry out the business that has been given to us by you. Bless those who are on and those who might come on later on and those who are listening that are not on at, at this time. And we ask that, Lord, everything that is done will be done to your glory. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Uh, everybody here is uh, has been here before, but welcome anyway. Um, you know, the, we have the rules. If you want to um, have a question during the presentation, just wave your hand. Use a little um, uh, icon to uh, so we can uh, acknowledge you. If you want don't want to talk at all, you just want to type it in the chat. Go ahead and do that, and we'll go ahead and acknowledge it and read it as well to get your statement out or observation or your question um, answered. Um, no real announcements today. Just want to remind you that we have our um, Bible interpretation uh, seminar coming up on the twenty sixth. 26 is the right day, eh? 26, a Saturday, um, with Reverend Chisholm, um, how to uh, basically um, learn to go through the Bible and put it into practice properly. All right, so we look forward to seeing you guys Saturday, August 26th at 10 a.m. at church, all right, in person. And we should have, um, uh, probably have it live streamed on YouTube or on, on Zoom. We're not quite sure how that part is going to work yet, but it'll be an online option um as well all right and with that uh sir i'll turn it over to you bless you brethren this month i thought with all of the attacks the continued attacks i should say on christianity i want to just introduce some aspects of defending the christian faith so tonight we will look at the relevance of christianity next week god willing my former philosophy lecturer william lane craig will take us through defending christianity then I'll return the third Wednesday, God willing, on a lecture I gave in Barbados at Conicar years upon years ago, the church's impact on Western civilization. And then we may go to Professor John Wart Montgomery on a defense for defending the faith with which we began looking last week. So I trust you will find it meaningful and helpful with material that you can share with others or just refer them to my website for the particular MP3 downloads. The relevance of Christianity, defending Christianity, the church's impact on Western civilization and a defense for defending the faith. Right. Now, even though we're playing this member now, you still can go ahead and put up your hand if you need it to be stopped and uh, question, right. question to be answered or anything like that. Don't, don't worry about it, it being... Um, Played here, but if you have, like I said, if you have something to ask or clarification, um, just throw up your hand or you know make a, a like a noise, and we will um, you'll pause and go ahead and get you in so you can have your question answered. All right, here we go. Relevance of Christianity. On today's program, Reverend Chisholm presents the first of a two-part series in which he invites you to think about the question. Is Christianity relevant in a modern technological world? Ravi Zacharias, a Christian apologist or defender of the faith, relates a story which illustrates the point that sometimes non-Christian thinkers build ideas and institutions 
on unrecognized foundations. And usually, these foundations are derived from Christianity, though not recognized as such. In other words, the relevance of Christianity for societal life is often overlooked. Ravi Zacharias and others visited the Wexner Center for the Performing Arts at the Ohio State University. The building was described by Newsweek as, quote, America's first deconstructionist building, unquote. Inside the building one meets, quote, stairways that go nowhere, pillars that hang from the ceiling without purpose, and angled surfaces configured to create a sense of vertigo, unquote. Zacharias says they were told that the architect designed the building to reflect life itself, senseless and incoherent, and also to reflect, quote, the capriciousness of the rules that organized the built world, unquote. Upon hearing that explanation, Zacharias asked a deadly question. Did the architect do the same with the foundation? A sensible, solid and coherent foundation is really relevant to a deconstructionist building, even if it is not perceived to be relevant. So I would suggest that there are two edges to relevance, the perceived and the real. Relevance has to do with the bearing or importance of one thing on or to another. And this relevance can be either perceived, recognized as such, or real, important to whether perceived or not. It is my conviction and contention that Christianity's worldview and witness are not simply in reality important, but critical to the contemporary world. It is also my conviction and contention that Christians have an obligation to help the contemporary world perceive, recognize the real relevance for the contemporary world of Christianity's worldview and witness. As we watch and listen and ponder the variety of diagnoses of the human condition and the Sorry, looks like we're having a technical difficulty here. Can you guys hear me? No, I'm hearing you. Okay, I don't know if they stop like that. Still showing that it's playing. Uh, hold on. Something of Mount Ellen. Zacharias asked a deadly question. Did the architect do the same with the foundation? A sensible, summary, important. All right, let's try it again. Kind of weird. All right. Summit. Summit of Mount Everest. All right, I put it, we went back maybe about 30 seconds, so. You probably will hear uh, something we heard already. All right, here we go. To, whether perceived or not. It is my conviction and contention that Christianity's worldview and witness. <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> All right, let me try one thing and I'll be right back. I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything you can want to ask in the meantime. The devil is trying to sabotage us. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm trying in a different thing now. Uh, technology. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great when it works. <laughs> and then when it doesn't. program where the chicken presents the first of a two part series in which he invites you to think about the question is Christianity relevant in the modern part series in which he invites you to think about the question is Christianity relevant in the modern technological world Rabbi Zacharias a Christian apologist or a defender of the faith relates a story which illustrates I think I was able to Get it here. Let me... That's everybody back now. Okay. It's the point that sometimes non Christian thinkers build ideas and institutions on unrecognized foundations. And usually, these foundations are derived from Christianity, though not recognized as such. In other words, the relevance of Christianity for societal life is often overlooked. Ravi Zacharias and others visited the Wexner Center for the Performing Arts at the Ohio State University. The building was described by Newsweek as, quote, America's first deconstructionist building, unquote. Inside the building one meets, quote, stairways that go nowhere, pillars that hang from the ceiling without purpose, and angled surfaces configured to create a sense of vertigo, unquote. Zacharias says they were told that the architect designed the building to reflect life itself, senseless and incoherent, and also to reflect, quote, the capriciousness of the rules that organize the built world, unquote. Upon hearing that explanation, Zacharias asked a deadly question. Did the architect do the same with the foundation? Hmm. A sensible, solid and coherent foundation is really relevant to a deconstructionist building, even if it is not perceived to be relevant. So I would suggest that there are two edges to relevance, the perceived and the real. Relevance has to do with the bearing or importance of one thing on or to another. And this relevance can be either perceived, recognized as such, or real, important to, whether perceived or not. It is my conviction and contention that Christianity's worldview and witness are not simply in reality important, but critical to the contemporary world. It is also my conviction and contention that Christians have an obligation to help the contemporary world perceive, recognize the real relevance for the contemporary world of Christianity's worldview and witness. As we watch and listen and ponder the variety of diagnoses of the human condition and the conflicting prescriptions for that condition, we must, like our sisters and brothers of earlier centuries, dare to share insights from the Bible. I deliberately said dare to share because one of the intimidating hallmarks of the contemporary world is pluralism plus an impatience with religious truth claims. By pluralism I mean a deliberate non-critical accommodation and polite acceptance of what is. This pluralism is based on the view that it is not just difficult but impossible to discover truth. Just think with me as we explore in this program and the next.
two important issues in all societies and Christianity's relevance to any serious discussion of these issues. The first is the global obsession with the well-being of humans. Why is humankind so important in the world of life forms and inanimate objects? Why, despite assorted animal rights advocates, animists and pantheists even, do we find the global agenda so humanity-centered? The assumptions and implications are clear. Humankind is essentially and qualitatively different from and superior to every other contingent form of life. Humankind is not just different, but uniquely different and superior in essence. This fundamental assumption or belief informs every social contract devised by humanity in community and is reflected in national constitutions, international charters, conventions, etc. It will be true then to say that the global agenda revolves around human beings and their well-being. So then the global agenda is humanitarian. Yet at the base of such an agenda is an annoying issue that begs for resolution. What is it that grounds the dignity and unique importance of humankind in the world? Though it might seem like a brazen assertion, the truth is there are only three basic and viable options in response to this annoying question. Let us now briefly examine each in turn. Option number one. Humanity is unique and dignified because society gives it that status. A major problem for this response is precisely what obtained in certain countries. If society gives the status, then it can be removed by society. On the premise then that humankind's dignity and worth come from society, we had no defensible argument against legal and institutional apartheid in South Africa. Ruling white people there had in their belief system that blacks had only selective and functional worth, and so the societal agenda reflected that belief. If society grounds man's dignity, then individuals labeled as dissidents or as being dysfunctional can be consigned to a detention camp without trial or simply killed. Society is not an adequate or safe basis for humankind's uniqueness and dignity. Option number two is scientific. Humankind is unique and dignified because of its place within the evolutionary framework of life forms. Think of it. Evolutionists accept the notion of survival of the fittest as a norm within their scheme of things. Why then should they be outraged when Nazis exterminate Jews, or when scientific socialists eliminate dissidents, or when capitalist governmental secret agents arrange the deaths of foreign leaders, or political activists deemed inimical to their government's interests? Still with reference to the evolutionary theory, and more importantly, if the theory is completely true concerning the origin and continuation of life forms, then it devalues humanity somewhat, leaving it at best as nothing more than the latest brand in a series of chance developments. Man then, as the late Francis Schaeffer put it, is simply the sum of impersonality, primeval slime, plus time, plus chance. Here the verdict of an eminent scientist on the cruciality of the chance concept in evolution. I quote the 1965 Nobel Prize winner Jacques Bonneau, commenting on mutations, the changes in the developmental processes of life forms, he says, quote, these events are accidental, due to chance, pure chance, absolutely free but blind, at the very root of the stupendous edifice of evolution, unquote. But Monod realizes the implications of his reasoning for humankind, because he says in the same book, Chance and Necessity, quote, There is no scientific position in any of the sciences more destructive of anthropocentrism than this one. The universe was not pregnant with life, nor the biosphere with man. Our number came up in the Monte Carlo game, unquote. Pages 110 
and 1v7. But evolution as a scientific hypothesis or theory has been under serious assault by even non-Christian scientists and especially by mathematicians. The self-confessed agnostic Robert Jastrow in his book God and the Astronomers argues from the scientific evidence available that the universe had a beginning and that Earth's delicate structure reveals an almost creative bias toward human life. He highlights the embarrassment this has been for some scientists in these words, quote, A sound explanation may exist for the explosive birth of our universe, but if it does, science cannot find out what the explanation is. The scientist's pursuit of the past ends in the moment of creation. This is an exceedingly strange development, unexpected by all but the theologians. The development is un unexpected because science has had such extraordinary success in tracing the chain of cause and effect backward in time. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries." Unquote. Pages 124 to 125. What is it about humankind that makes us so mindful of it, that gives it such uniqueness and dignity in the universe? Certainly not its place within the so-called evolutionary scheme of things. Evolution is not an adequate or safe basis for humankind's uniqueness and dignity. Wretched existence that humankind is. What can deliver it from a sense of meaninglessness? And what can ground its dignity and uniqueness? Before we despair completely, let us give a hearing to a final option. This is, as you would guess, a biblical option, which, though not removing all questions, seems to be the best justification for humankind's dignity and uniqueness in the world. This option, simply put, is that humankind is unique and dignified because of its God connection. We explain from Psalm 8 along with Genesis 1 and verse 26. I leave you with four easily remembered points supporting this notion of humankind's God connection and serving as adequate bases for humanity's dignity and uniqueness. From these passages, humankind is unique and dignified because unlike every other contingent form of life, humankind has been one, created by and in the image of God. Psalm 8, 5 and Genesis 1, 6, 26 affirm that humans uniquely are created by God and in the image of God. Two, humankind has been cl classed near to God. Psalm 8, 5 says in the original Hebrew that humans are created, quote, a little lower than Elohim, or God, unquote. Three, humankind has been crowned by God. Psalm 8, 5 again teaches that God has regaled humanity with honor and dignity. Four, humankind has been commissioned by God as steward. The witness of Psalm 8, 6 to 8, is that God has set humanity above every creature, a position of responsible stewardship. So then, it is our God connection that qualifies as the most defensible basis for our dignity and uniqueness as human beings in the universe. Any idea, institution, or program that builds on this foundation must realize it is building on a Judeo-Christian foundation. In our last broadcast, we looked at the relevance of Christianity for the global enterprise of treating humanity as especially important, and concluded that humanity's uniqueness and dignity is best grounded in the Judeo-Christian doctrine of humanity's God connection, having been created by God and in God's image. We now engage in critical thinking about the second major societal issue, 
for which Christianity is really extremely relevant. Values. Those higher and better principles that seem so necessary to a humane society. There is no doubt about it, our world is in the throes of a serious values crisis. And many who once publicly lambasted the suggested principles of the Bible are now privately, albeit reluctantly, giving second thoughts to the notion of absolutes, things that are always right or always wrong. It seems now that the biblical statement, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, is not so backward, given the mess that enlightened libertarian philosophies have spawned in a world. Maybe the enlightened of the world who would not normally listen to a clergyman might heed the words of Bernard Henri Levy, one of France's greatest contemporary philosophers, who said, quote, I am not a man of faith, but I think if we are looking for a new foundation of ethics, the best ground is the old biblical tradition. Marxism maintains there is no absolute ethics, truth, evil, and good. It all depends on the circumstance and the class which is expressing it. Hmm. If you want, however, to escape this relativity of ethics, you'll find the tools and inspiration in the Bible. The strong New Testament principles of sexual purity for the married and chastity for the unmarried having been knocked for decades as repressive, are now being recommended, albeit with grave embarrassment, by the Masters and Johnsons of our world. In their 1988 book, Crisis, Heterosexual Behavior in the Age of AIDS, Masters Johnson and Colotney sound like budding preachers in the advice they offer in sections of the book. Listen to these experts on the value of abstinence. Quote, Although the choice does not have much appeal to most adults, there is something to be said for a deliberate decision to abstain from sexual activity as a means of completely avoiding the risks of sexual exposure to the AIDS virus. To serve this purpose, though, abstinence can't be a part-time proposition. It must become, in effect, a way of life. Unquote. Page 95. On the issue of condom use, they are very blunt in their warning. Quote, a good case can be made that consistent condom use will in fact provide a certain degree of protection. But to think that condom use is perfect, or even near perfect, in eliminating the risk of HIV transmission is foolishness of the highest order. Yet many medical experts, public health officials, and educators have jumped on the bandwagon proclaiming condoms are life-saving devices, giving the public the impression that using condoms is all that has to be done. Though this is understandable, to suggest that condom use is a complete answer in the fight against AIDS is to oversimplify and mislead in an irresponsible fashion. Unquote. Pages 116 to 117. The worldly wise are slowly wising up to the fact that promiscuity diminishes the depths of human sexual relationships designed by God for mutual, heterosexual self-expression and self-emptying with a sense of psychic ease. But this is only possible where there is guaranteed love commitment, purity and fidelity. The fear of being just another conquest, of catching something, of being used, militate against this psychic ease and robs any sexual exchange of true depth. 
But in light of the rampancy of lies and corruption in society, can we forget our Lord's character principle of letting your yes be yes and your no, no? This is a truth telling as an absolute principle and also an integrity principle, which is reinforced elsewhere in the New Testament, in Ephesians, for instance. Both truth telling as an absolute and integrity are values that are crucial to what most of us desire in any society right now. But let's be clear what we mean by truth telling as an absolute and by integrity. For us, integrity is wholehearted, abiding fidelity to wholesome, abiding principles. And this includes truth telling as an absolute, which we see as never ever consciously declaring as truth what is known or suspected to be false. How are these relevant, you might ask? Remember the scams and assorted scandals of the past few years in your country and forget integrity and you have no justification for the protracted furore that those scams and scandals caused in your country. If absolutes are dead and relativism rules, what is wrong with bogus contracts, swindling a company or ripping off the public? If absolutes are dead and relativism rules, why should police officers always investigate and report their cases fairly? Why can't they lie or doctor the evidence occasionally or even regularly? Why should witnesses always tell the truth? Justice according to law demands that every witness speak the truth absolutely and integrity if meaningful demands abiding fidelity to wholesome principles. The Bible points humanity to truth-telling as an absolute and it repeatedly demands of God-fearers and Christians the character mark of integrity. But comedy and tragedy are sometimes mixed in the wake of humanity's move away from the principles of God's Word. I recall watching the news in America some years ago and saw an item that really cracked me up. A guard was posted on the banks of a river in the New York area to guard a special breed of water duck brooding over her eggs, lest anyone should deliberately or inadvertently damage the eggs or the duck. What made me laugh was the guard's statement when interviewed by the camera crew. He smilingly said, quote, In my 15 years as a guard, this is my first assignment as a dock watcher. Unquote. <laughs> then it dawned on me that New York is reputed to be the abortion capital of America and possibly of the world. So unborn ducks are guarded, unborn humans are slaughtered. What confusion of values! And dare we forget that the same Supreme Court in America that ruled in favor of abortion on demand ruled against the construction of the Teleco Dam in Tennessee because it might wipe out the snail data, a three-inch fish. A dam on the Stanislaus River in California ran into legal difficulties because a five-eighths of an inch spider, a rare spider, lived there. Let us be clear. When humanity rejects the clarifying light of the Bible, we are left with conflicting values, a confused system of morality, and a severely diminished concept of humanity. Let the Bible speak in the language of our day, but we dare not compromise its content to suit the spirit of the times. I believe that the Bible is not an addendum, but the source and criterion of truth for life. Mm -hmm. And I further believe that its principles, properly understood, are relevant in the shaping of human and humane lives in every society. Let me close then with the words of a Bible Society handout 
that I've kept in my files over the years. Quote, If the Bible is true, get it. It is bad for one not to obtain the truth, even if it calls for sacrifice. If the Bible is true, study it. He who does not study the truth descends to the depth of error and ignorance. If the Bible is true, share it. He who does not spread the truth contributes to the development of heresies. If the Bible is true, preach it. Silence is a traitor to the truth. If the Bible is true, distribute it. He does not well who does not cooperate in order that his fellow men may know the truth. If the Bible is true, live it. He who does not live the truth lives a lie." Unquote. It may seem extremely odd to many that in a post-Christian world there is still such a group as the Bible Society, existing not only to promote reading of a particular ancient collection of documents for its literary and aesthetic values, but deliberately promoting this ancient collection of documents so that its contents might affect people's concepts, character, and conduct. How and what people think, who people really are, and how people behave will always be important concerns in any society. And as such, the Bible will always be relevant and challenging because it suggests pointers on some fundamental concerns for humanity in society. Okay, so time for your questions, your comments, your observations on what you have heard. You could allow the little music to play out, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a, so now it After doesn't go for Why do we need something soothing? <laughs> Any questions, observations, David? I, I, I don't think that um, people in the world really understand are willing to accept the value of the word of God. Right. I, I think that, I think you said that earlier, that it does uh, some archaic stuff that was written by some people a long time ago, but not relevant for today. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the third take with my lecture on the church's impact on Western civilization that is brought out very clearly as to how Christianity over the past 2000 years has transformed or made moves of transforming societies in what we now call the Western world. Mm -hmm. Many of the traditions which we revere and give thanks for are derived from Christian principles or started by Christians, you know, in ancient times. I mentioned just one. Uh, to steal just a little piece of my thunder then take the red cross across the globe the red cross is known for its concern about protecting and saving lives even of people who are at the point of death they, they have renamed the red cross in countries that don't respect christianity like the lion lion cross in in israel the red star or the Red Crescent in Muslim countries, but they are building on the same foundation of the Red Cross. So people don't recognize these things. They have forgotten them. Their history is warped or forgotten. And so they don't recognize the relevance, the current relevance of Christianity in all of so-called Western societies. I mean, you're saying that it reminds me of like um, even like the Salvation Army, 
right? Salvation Army hospitals yeah. were started by Christians. Yeah. Homes yeah. to take care of disposed children, infants, and so on. Yeah. All started by Christians. The universities, the best ones, if you check the and wipe off the moss from the plaques on their sides, you will see that they were started by a Christian, for Christians initially, and then for general populations. Do we, the, the world owes a lot to the church of Jesus Christ or to Christianity for what it has left. Take, for instance, the idea of a law called the Good Samaritan Law. I don't call it, as I tell my Greek students, don't call the, the man the Good Samaritan. That is reflecting Jewish prejudice. It's the Samaritan, but it's a person who cared for another, who would not regard that individual as a regular human being, but he's still sacrificed for that individual. And so Jesus at the end of that parable says, no, who was neighbor in the, in the accounts? And the, the, the lawyer who was testing him answered, the one who showed care for the other. You have rightly said, go and do likewise, our Lord said to him. In uh, liberal America, the Good Samaritan Law, uh, an anachronism in our culture legally, societally, but it is there because of the recognition, at least when that law was introduced, of the indebtedness that the society in America owes to the Samaritan parable. Anybody else? I have a question. Sure. Um, go back to your, your, the first section where you said, why is humankind so important? Mm -hmm. um, Go back in Genesis, when God made man, remember he bent down and he made us from the ground. Mm -hmm. But the others, he just spoke it like, with the fish, he just speak it and um, they come Everything to be. Was, Everything was spoken, spoken but existence. God made us with their hand. He, with, he handled us into creation. Yes. Special, so I think that's why we are special. To him, and to, to beyond God. the handling, we are all as human beings created by God, Yes. And into existence and in the image of God no other existent has been done like that right they create after the they multiply and create after their own kind we are of the image and likeness of God communicable attributes that God has are within us very special we are yeah I, I think that was um very good for system now to point out i mean because, yeah um you know we don't seem to see humanity as 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 anything you know yeah. but when you look at what is going on today it looks like we can dispense with each other without Precisely. any any care or concern mm -hmm. uh, and 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 that is why i believe so many people are just killing killing other people Arbitrarily, no yeah. reason at all, because yeah. they don't understand the value mm -hmm. that God has placed upon the life of of, of um, human beings. Mm -hmm. And if we're not all, every single one of us from every single ethnic group, created by God and the image of God, we could treat other with despite. I mean, I could look down on anybody else who is not, let's say, Negroid, but the non-Negroid person is as much created by God and in the image of God as we who are of Negro ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Everybody is priceless, of inestimable worth because of the connection with God. And when the English of, this, of Psalm 8 says, he has made us a little lower than the angels. Mm -hmm. The original, that is um, a little ed edition that they the scribes couldn't contain that thought. It is, too, it is too glorious a thought. So they just put angels in the margin because they couldn't tamper with the original Hebrew. And in translations into languages, you know, apart from the, the Hebrew, the angels became the translation in English. But it says a little lower than Elohim. God has placed humanity a little lower than himself. Yeah. That's, that's pride of place. So I tell people, if you, if you want to lift up your estimate of yourself before you think of taking your own life, just ponder how God sees you, created by God, 
and in the image of God, class near to God, uh, crowned by God with dignity and honor, specifically said in the Psalm 8 text, and commissioned by God, special appointment as stewards over creation. There's much to live for, no matter how poor, no matter how bad your life is, respect God's status that he has placed upon you and seek to surrender your borrowed life back to him and trust and serve him and live for him. Yes. Is that why he said he gave us um, human, make human dominion over the animals and everything else? That's right. And That's yes, so. We do abuse mm. the stewardship of time. We rape the earth and we wonder why we have cyclones and earthquakes and all these things. We have yeah. not been responsible as we should be. But I, I guess we abuse our power because we got it, but we abuse it. Precisely. Yeah. And we have to account for the poor stewardship. The day of accountability is coming. In, in my sermon for Sunday in August, I'm going to look at this, the parable of the vineyard, mm -hmm. where stewardship comes up front and center. It, 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 it speaks about the value of the, the life of the human being. Right, right. And, and, and um, yet, there are those who will take the life of a person and don't even think about it, like, mm -hmm. you know, like you kill a bird or kill a dog. That's right. We can't kill dogs now, Danny. <laughs> yeah, what is in the arrest if you kill a dog? You can't, can't kill dogs. Uh, uh, but, fact, but, even, but, but even, no, even turtles. Like they, they, can kill, they can kill human beings and get away with it. With abandon, that's right. Yeah. I remember when I was in South Florida, I was doing Bible study one night, and in the house where we lived, across from the Metropolitan Baptist Church, there were lizards in there. My wife does not have any regard for lizards in her house. She says, Clinton, is either me or the lizards. Not the two of us the same house. Mm. So at Bible study, I, I unwisely, because I didn't know the culture here, it was um, early in 2004, one of the first Bible studies I did at Metropolitan. And at the end, I said, does anybody know something that is effective to kill lizards? One of the deacons beckoned to me with his index finger. And he says, Pastor, if I were you, I would not say that again in public. Because they are protected as wildlife. And you could be locked up, turtle on the road in the middle of, um, I forgot the name of the road now, Sheridan. Uh, a lady parks on the side of the road, goes into the middle of the road, takes up the turtle, and gently puts the turtle back in the grassy area and goes on. This um, the big lizards are uh, what they call them? Iguana. 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 Stand up in the middle of Sheridan, traffic racing, and they they go around it and around it, but none would try. And the, the stupid thing has his has his upper limbs up in the air like say, "When you are match me, I see what I'm doing." <laughs> 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 no, I, I saw that thing and I, I marveled and said, my God, look how careful we are with not hitting down an iguana and we slaughter humans in the womb without with abandon. Yeah. No, with not. Values confusion, a mess of values because That's we right. have strayed away from the light of God's word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if we all would recognize the value of a human life, Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have so many killings, uh, you know, right. I mean, randomly killing with, mm -hmm. without any, any, any thoughts uh, as to what is happening here. And, and, when, and, and boy, I tell you. And when Paul wants to lift up the, our view of other human beings, in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, when he's talking about you have the liberty to eat or drink whatever you want, but show due regard for your weaker brother. And he adds, the person for whom Christ died. Mm -hmm. How dare I despise you as a brother in church or a sister in church when God sees you as someone for whom his son Jesus Christ died? That's lifting the value of a human being in a fellowship. And he says, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Put no offense for Jew, Greek, barbarian, or the church of God. Show due regard for people. Don't exercise your liberty and make it become license. And you disregard how other people feel about how you're living. Yes, you can do that because it's not unlawful. But is it appropriate? Is it expedient for your testimony? 
or for your own personal life. It, the text of God's word makes us rethink how we live and move and have our being in community. What a, what a place this world would be if 50% if, oh. if a, if a, if of the world would think like this. Yeah. Uh, it would make a, a great difference. A virtual paradise on earth again. Yeah. Yeah, the scripture, I think it is Corinthian or Romans that says after God gave them over to their reprobate mind, something like that. I don't yeah. remember. Romans chapter one. Yeah. Because they don't want to maintain God in their minds. God yeah. gave them up to a reprobate mind. Yeah. They worship the creature more than the creator. Mm. Romans 1. Romans 1, yeah. We are indebted to God, but we don't really realize it. That, 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 that is well said. That is well said. I heard a little joke years ago, and I use it primarily, uh, principally in Jamaica, because other people would not make appreciate the Jamaican nuance. The language is so poetic that there was a Satan came up with God's face and said, you know, God, I don't know how people worship you and big you up as if you, you're more important than anybody else. I can do anything that you can do. God said, serious? He said, yes, you can't do anything that you can do. God said, all right, create somebody. And the devil bent down to scoop up some dirt and God tapped him on the toe. My youth, find your own dirt. <laughs> you guys start with God dirt and claim you can't do anything what God can do. You out of order. You're not thinking logically. <laughs> and human beings as scientists think that they know more than God. Yes. And yes. Some, of, some of the some of the, 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 the racking diseases that I think have come on the world is like a humbling factor. All right. See if you can deal with this one. Cancer. Mm. Look how long we've been battling with cancer. Mm. We go put man on the moon. We, we put man on, uh, people can visit other planets now, but we still can't um, correct can't cancer. Figure out. Can't figure out an answer for cancer. And we boast that we are modern, scientific. Hmm. God will humble us. Hmm. Definitely. <laughs> Anything else, anybody? A question, a final one, a comment, an observation? Can I ask a final question? Um, sure. In regards yeah. to a topic that you, you did about three weeks ago, um, mm -hmm. you were talking about God give us gifts. Mm -hmm. And um, if somebody can die before they, their gifts are being revealed, or, or they, uh, it's like an untimely death, do you think that's possible? Or when you untimely. die, it's your time? Untimely death is a, is a figure of speech in English. And sometimes we can see with it, but if you think about it, but only God knows when your time is. Mm -hmm. We as human beings might speculate and we say, you know, that was his time, but we're not quite sure. You could die an mm. untimely death because God did not have that date as your day of death. Mm -hmm. But mm. we can't speak too, too um, dogmatically, you know, about it. But untimely death is an expression in English, you know, premature birth premature death are expressions in English. And English is, is a puzzling language and very limited. Mm -hmm. But that's a human, a human perspective we're taking on those issues. Yeah. Well, I guess if you die now, it's your time. You, you, you already done what you were supposed to do on this earth or now. That, that, that is the view. But we're mm -hmm. not sure that that is necessarily true. Possibly true, probably, maybe likely, but we're not certain. Okay. But one one thing we're sure that um, if if God don't say come, you can't leave. Right. Yeah. That's what I was I was getting to because if you die, it's your time. That's you know if you die now, it's your time to go. Right. Because God said you're ready to come. Right. He calls you home. He calls you home. Right. But what, the challenge of that is that we need to do as much as we can while we are here. Right. While we have time, let's maximize our gifts mm -hmm. for the use of God's kingdom building in and through the local church. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know when our time is. That's right. That's right. 
And I remember asking at one funeral, I say, you know, it's, it's interesting. It should be strange to us, but it isn't. That when a young person dies, we say, my God, mm -hmm. why did the person die so young? You know, why did God take the person? We are assuming that God has called over the person. Okay, maybe a fear assessment, but why do we say so soon as if God owes us life? <laughs> he owes us That's about to ask that question. <laughs> Every time we somebody dies, what we call young. at a young age, we should give God thanks for the years that the person spent in our yes, midst, yes. because God doesn't owe us one day, one sure. year, you know, or 20 years or 15 years. He owes us nothing. This is why, as a person who grew up in the courts and wanted to have been a lawyer, I challenge lawyers in public and I say, look, we have to stop this legal nonsense about the right to life. Nobody has a right to life. Life is not a right. It's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Every single day you get up, thank God for the loan of another day of life. Because he does not owe anybody anything. And we have to learn from the rich fool. Listen to his language. Bumper crop, you don't know what to do. This I shall do. I shall build bigger barns and I shall store my goods. And I shall say to myself, self, mm -hmm. there was much goods laid up for many years. That same night, God called him. Mm -hmm. He was mm -hmm. unprepared for death. And the, the text calls him fool. But notice yeah. how the text ex, it goes on to say, so is everyone who is rich with goods in this life, but is not rich towards God. Yes. We are like that man fool. Maybe we're not a rich fool, just an educated idiot. You know, <laughs> or, or a handsome or gorgeous fool. But fool nonetheless, because we are not living God consciously, time consciously, and life consciously. Mm. If we're not living yeah. that way, we are like that man in the parable, fool. And, and we should be conscious because we don't know when it is that we are going to go, go Precisely, up. precisely. Yeah. You plan your nest egg and you don't know when you're going dead. Hmm. Yeah, we're on a great risk. Yeah. Anybody who's not living for Jesus is living recklessly and dangerously mm -hmm. and senselessly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Nebuchadnezzar, so he yeah. does look at what he has and say, oh, look at what I have. But God put him in the, the field, he become an animal. Yeah. So and sometimes God has to bring you down because sometimes you feel right. like you own everything and you don't own a thing. That's right. You're too big, yeah. big for your breaches, right? Yeah, yeah. And you have to be humbled. Humbled, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. All right, we call it a night. Yeah, we call it there. Reverend, does you mind praying, praying us out, sir, please? Thank you, brother. Thanks. Bless yes. you, my brother. Thank you. Appreciate it. We look to everybody next week. Sovereign God, we thank you for the loan of life daily, the measure of health you give to us, even though sometimes we suffer afflictions. Cause us to be conscious of the need for every single one of us, blessed with life, to live life consciously, God consciously, and time consciously. We pray that those of us who have been exposed to the teaching tonight will be refreshed in good sleep and tomorrow determined. I must find somebody to tell tomorrow of Jesus Christ's love and what he means in our lives. So we pray your blessings upon our efforts in your name tomorrow. And we ask for your blessings on our sleep tonight and our rest. For Jesus Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. Night, night, brethren. Night, night, everybody. Night, night everybody. Night. Bye. Night, everybody. Bye.